I was born on the border of the bluegrass region in Kentucky, of poor but honest parents, as they do in stories. No hero ever had the advantage of me in that respect. My family wasn't much for creature comforts, but we had something better, a thirst for learning. The country around my old home had good schools, so we had the advantage of a good education. It wasn't much, mind you, but it was enough to set a young man's mind to dreaming of better things. When I was about nineteen, restless and eager to make my mark on the world, I went away from home one winter to teach school. It was a little country school about fifteen miles from home which might as well have been a thousand miles in those days. In the old states, fifteen miles from home makes you a dead rank stranger, and I felt every inch of that distance. I remember the day I went to apply for the school as clear as if it was yesterday. The trustee of the township was out in his field shucking corn when I arrived. Not wanting to seem lazy, I simply whipped out my peg and helped him shuck out a shock or two while we talked over school matters. It was a good move, I reckon. The dinner bell rang, and he insisted on my staying for dinner with him. Over plates of steaming food, he gave me a better school than I had asked for. Better neighborhood, he said. Then he told me to board with a certain family who had no children. He told me they were good folks and that they'd take care of me right. He wasn't wrong about that. They proved to be fine people, salt of the earth types. The woman of the house was one of those kindly souls who never know where to stop. From the moment I set foot in their home, she took me under her wing like a mother hen with a new chick. Now, I didn't know it at the time. But that good woman had plans for me. She schemed to marry me off in spite of myself. Bless her heart. The first month that I was with them, she told me all about the girls in that immediate neighborhood. In fact, she rather got me unduly excited, being a youth and somewhat verdant. I hung on her every word, imagining each girl she described as if they were characters out of a dime novel. But there was one girl she dwelt on more than the others. She lived in a big brick house which stood back of the road some distance. This girl, according to my landlady, was something special. She'd gone to school at a seminary for young ladies near Lexington. She studied music and painting and was way up on everything. The way she described her You'd think she was some kind of angel come down to earth. She was black-eyed and with raven tresses, just like you read about in novels. Well, things were rocking along nicely. I was settling into my role as the schoolteacher, and I'd hear bits and pieces about this mystery girl from time to time. Then, a few days before Christmas, Everything changed. A little girl who belonged to the family who lived in the brick house brought me a note one morning. My heart nearly leapt out of my chest when I saw it. It was an invitation to take supper with them the following evening. The note was written in a pretty hand, and the name signed to it. Well, I'm satisfied now it was a forgery, but at the time, it looked like it had been penned by the angels themselves. I was so excited I could hardly think straight. Like a fool, I took the note to my landlady, wanting to consult her and ask her advice. Lord, you should have seen her face. She was in the seventh heaven of delight. She had me answer it at once, accept the invitation with pleasure and a lot of stuff that I never used before. She had been young once herself, she reminded me with a wink. I used up five or six sheets of paper in writing the answer, spoilt one after another, and the one I did send was a flat failure compared to the one I received. But it would have to do. The next evening, when it was time to start for the brick house, 
I was nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. It was nearly dark when I reached the house, but I wanted it that way. Gave me a bit of cover, you see. But let me tell you, when I knocked on the front door of that house, it was with fear and trembling. My knees were knocking so loud I was sure they could hear it inside. The very affable lady who received me asked if I was Mr. Quarternight. I knew I was one of old man Quarternight's seven boys, and admitted that that was my name, though it was the first time anyone had ever called me Mr. Felt like I was playing dress up in my pa's clothes. I was welcomed, ushered in, and introduced all around. There were a few small children whom I knew from school, so I managed to talk to them, grateful for something familiar to cling to. But then I saw her, the girl. Let me tell you, she was not a particle overrated, but sustained the Kentucky reputation for beauty. She made herself so pleasant and agreeable that my fears soon subsided. I began to think that maybe, just maybe, this wasn't going to be the disaster I'd feared. When the man of the house came in, I was cured entirely of my nervousness. He was gruff and hearty, opened his mouth and laughed deep. I built right up to him. We talked about cattle and horses until supper was announced. He was really sorry I hadn't come earlier, so as to look at a three-year-old colt that he set a heap of store by. Promised to show him to me after supper with a lantern. Now, I don't remember much about the supper itself, except that it was fine, and I came near spilling my coffee several times. My hands felt like ham hocks, too big for the delicate china, and my coat sleeves were so short I was afraid they'd laugh me right out of the house. But if they noticed, they were too polite to say anything. After supper, true to his word, the man of the house took me out to see that colt, Fine animal, too. Strong legs. Good confirmation. The kind of horse a man could be proud of. We talked horses for a while, the cold night air nipping at our faces before heading back inside. When we returned, we went into the parlor. Say, it was a little the nicest thing that ever I went against. Carpet that made you think you were going to bog down every step springy like marshland. I was glad I came, if only to see how the other half lived. Then the younger children were ordered to retire, and shortly afterward the man and his wife followed suit. When I heard the old man throw his heavy boots on the floor in the next room, I realized that I was left all alone with their charming daughter. All my fears of the early part of the evening tried to crowd on me again but were calmed by the girl, who sang and played on the piano with no audience but me. Her voice was like honey, sweet and smooth. She sang songs I'd never heard before, fancy things from back east, I reckoned. Then she interested me by telling her school experiences and how glad she was that they were over. I hung on her, every word, feeling like I was getting a glimpse into a world I'd only ever dreamed about. Finally, she lugged out a great big family album and sat down aside of me on one of these horsehair sofas. That album had a clasp on it, a buckle of pure silver, same as these $18 bridles. While we were looking at the pictures, some of the old varmints had fought in the Revolutionary War, so she said. I noticed how close we were sitting together. I could smell the lavender in her hair, feel the warmth of her arm against mine. It was intoxicating. We went through that album page by page, her telling me stories about each grim-faced ancestor. Some of them looked like they'd been weaned on a pickle, but she made them sound like the most interesting folks who'd ever lived. As we neared the end of the album, I realized we'd shifted apart, now sitting at opposite ends of the sofa. We talked about the neighborhood, safe topics that wouldn't get a young man in trouble. 
Time flew by, and suddenly I remembered that I had to go. While she was getting my hat and I was getting away, somehow she had me promise to take dinner with them on Christmas. I floated home that night, my feet barely touching the ground. For the next two or three months, it was hard to tell if I lived at my boarding house or at the brick house. If I failed to go, my landlady would hatch up some errand and send me over. If she hadn't been such a good woman, I'd never forgive her for leading me to the sacrifice like she did. But at the time, I thought I was living in a dream. I spent every spare moment at that brick house. I learned every crack in the sidewalk, every creak in the porch steps. I could find my way there blindfolded, I reckon. The girl and I, we talked about everything under the sun. She told me about her dreams, her hopes for the future. And fool that I was, I started to think maybe I could be part of that future. But life has a way of bringing you back down to earth, and hard. About two weeks before school was out, I went home over Saturday and Sunday. Those were fatal days in my life. When I returned on Monday morning, there was a letter waiting for me. It was from the girl's mama, and as soon as I saw it, I knew something was wrong. It turned out there had been a quilting in the neighborhood on Saturday, and at this meet of the local gossips, someone had hinted that there was liable to be a wedding as soon as school was out. The girl's mama had been present, and neither admitted nor denied the charge. But there was a woman at this quilting who had once lived over in our neighborhood, and she felt it her duty to enlighten the company as to who I was. I got all this later from my landlady, who heard it from her cousin's wife's sister, or some such. Law me, this woman had said, folks round here in this section think our teacher is the son of that big farmer who raises so many cattle and horses. Why, I've known both families of those quarter nights for nigh on to thirty year. Our teacher is one of old John Fox's boys, the Irish quarter nights, who live up near the salt licks on Doe Run. They were always so poor that the children never had enough to eat and hardly half enough to wear. This plain statement of facts fell like a bombshell on the girl's mama. She started a private investigation of her own, and her verdict was in that letter. It was a center shot right to my heart. That evening when I locked the schoolhouse door, it was for the last time, for I never unlocked it again. My landlady, dear old womanly soul, tried hard to have me teach the school out at least, but I didn't see it that way. The cause of education in Kentucky might have gone straight to eternal hell before I'd have stayed another day in that neighborhood. I had money enough to get to Texas with, and here I am. When a fellow gets it burnt into him like a brand that way once, it lasts him quite a while. He'll feel his way next time, if there is a next time, and some folks claim that seven is a lucky number. There were seven boys in our family, and nary one ever married. Maybe we're just not cut out for it, or maybe that Kentucky girl took all the love I had to give. 